In all of Byzantine and indeed European history, few rulers could claim to match the depth or breadth of Leo VI's wisdom. Not for nothing was he called Hosophos, the wise. Leo was the second of the sixteen Macedonian emperors that ruled the empire. By his time, Byzantium was no longer fighting off existential threats and was on the road to recovery. Nothing in Byzantium was ever certain though, and Leo's reign would not be without its fair share of troubles. Leo was born on the 24th of September 866, yet from the outset a shadow existed over his birth. His mother was Eudokia Ringerina, of that much we are sure. The exact identity of his father, however, is a far less settled matter. Eudokia Ringerina was the mistress of Emperor Michael III. She was also the wife of a certain Basil, one of Michael's closest associates. The reasons for this situation have already been covered in my video on Basil's rise to power, but essentially this situation allowed Michael to visit his lover whenever he wished, without any hassle. Michael was a fatally weak-willed man, and he came to rely upon Basil more and more, until in 866 he proclaimed Basil co-emperor. It was under these conditions that Leo was born. Basil, as Eudokia's husband, officially claimed him as his own, but it's equally likely that Michael was Leo's true father. Despite being companions for the better part of a decade, relations between Michael and Basil quickly soured during their shared rule, with Basil trying to stamp his control over the empire. Then, on the 24th of September 867, exactly one year after Leo's birth, Basil murdered Michael in cold blood. Basil was many things, but sentimental wasn't one of them. He now sat alone atop the imperial throne. Thus began Basil's sole rule of the empire, which lasted for nearly two decades, and saw a continued resurgence of Byzantine power. Leo spent these formative years in the shadow of his older brother Constantine, Basil's eldest son by his first wife Maria. Constantine had inherited Basil's towering stature and impressive physique, and showed much promise as a future emperor. It's no surprise then that Basil loved Constantine in a way that he never did anyone else, especially not his other sons. Especially not Leo, who was physically weaker and more academically inclined. Thankfully, Leo grew to be a remarkably easygoing man, and the people would come to appreciate him for his generosity, intellect and charm. His life would take a turn in 879, when Prince Constantine died suddenly, making Leo the heir apparent. Leo probably would have liked nothing more than to remain in Constantine's shadow. Basil dearly loved his eldest son, reserving for the others a mix of disappointment and disdain. Yet with Constantine's death, the full weight of Basil's paranoia was turned on Leo. If their relationship had been frosty before, it was openly hostile now. A flashpoint came when Basil married his son off to a woman of immense piety called Theophano. Their marriage was chilly and mostly unproductive, with only one daughter being born to them. The prince was still a horny young teen at this point, and either just before or just after the marriage, he took a mistress, the beautiful Zoe Zaltzina. When Basil heard of this, he was furious, physically beating Leo and forcing Zoe to marry someone else. The relationship between father and son only deteriorated in light of this incident, with scheming courtiers dripping poison into the emperor's ear, and trying to turn him against his son. The prince's greatest enemy in this regard was the patriarch, a man named Photius. He needs a bit of explanation. If you've watched the previous video, then you'll know that Photius was appointed patriarch in 858 by Michael III, and then deposed by Basil in 867. Now, however, he had managed to worm his way back into Basil's good graces, and had been reappointed to the Patriarchate in 877. As he grew old, the Emperor came to rely more and more upon the Patriarch, and Photius used his influence to blacken Leo's name. In the end, his whisperings worked, and Leo was imprisoned. He would spend three months in the slammer, during which time Basil very nearly had him blinded, but eventually he relented due to public pressure. Whatever the Emperor may have thought of him, the prince remained very popular in the capital, and his confinement was only temporary. Ultimately, the prince's sufferings only ended with the death of his father in 886. The old emperor died in a hunting accident, but there's a chance that he was a victim of some conspiracy, possibly involving Leo himself. I've already looked at this possibility in my video on Basil's reign, so I won't repeat myself here, but just know that Leo might have been involved somehow. Certainly, there was no love lost between the two men. And so, on the 29th of August, 886, Leo became senior emperor at age 19. Like most rulers, his first task was to organise his father's funeral. 
Unsurprisingly, Basil's funeral honours were kept at a minimum. What he did next, however, did cause some surprise, namely the reburial of Michael III. After his assassination, Michael had been buried in a town opposite Constantinople. Now, Leo had him brought over to Constantinople, where he was buried in the Church of the Holy Apostles, alongside dozens of other emperors slain to rest. This, of course, only added fuel to the rumours that Michael was Leo's real father, and it's hard to see why Leo did this other than as an act of filial piety. With this done, Leo VI could throw himself fully into the job of ruling. The first item on the agenda was the man who had done so much to harm Leo during his father's reign, Patriarch Photios. Not only was there a personal resentment between the two men, but Photius was also determined to assert the rights of the church against the state. Leo, of course, was profoundly unamused by this, and so in early 887 Photius was deposed and replaced with none other than Leo's brother, 15-year-old Stephen, who the emperor knew could be relied upon. In the domestic sphere, Leo appointed a man named Stylian Zautzes as his chief minister. He was the father of Leo's mistress, Zoe, and a loyal supporter of the emperor, with these people in place, Leo could get to work on the nitty-gritty jobs, most importantly, the codification of the laws that had begun under his father. Basil I had started the reorganisation and streamlining of Byzantine laws during his reign, but he hadn't lived to see the job completed, and Leo VI was left to continue where he left off. Here, once again, the scholarly character of Leo shines through, and while he can't hold all the credit, the eventual product of these law reforms was undoubtedly much improved by his attention. It wasn't just the law code that benefited from Leo's scholarly character, though. Several texts, treaties, and works on a variety of different topics were issued under his name, many of which survive to today and give us invaluable insights into the past. The work of Stylian Zautzes cannot be ignored either, and Leo's chief minister also worked hard to see the project through. It was completed sometime around 892. Two years later, in 894, Leo and Stylian would make their first serious misstep, under Stylian's watch, Byzantine trade officials began slapping Bulgarian merchants with heavy tariffs and moved the main trading post from Constantinople to Thessalonica. They did this because in Thessalonica, corrupt practices would be much harder to detect, but it had the side effect of essentially destroying the Black Sea trade routes. Understandably, the Bulgarians were shocked by this foolish and greedy decision, a decision that didn't benefit anyone except the officials themselves who could now fleece the poor merchants with impunity. Simeon, the king of Bulgaria, immediately appealed to Leo, but the emperor quickly shot him down. Having exhausted diplomacy, Simeon turned to war. Luckily for him, imperial armies were currently distracted elsewhere, and he had an easy time plundering Thrace. In an attempt to get Simeon off his back, Leo turned to the oldest trick in the Byzantine textbook, bribing a tribe called the Magyars to attack the Bulgarians from the north. Then, making use of the Byzantine navy, they crossed the Danube and swarmed into Bulgaria. Simeon, however, was wise to Leo's ways, and bribed another tribe called the Pechenegs to attack the Magyars. Now surrounded, the Magyars were defeated and driven off. Simeon then swung south, and steamrolled the imperial army at the Battle of Bulgarophagon. Leo, faced with no other option, sued for peace in 896. Leo's other foreign policy failures can be excused to some extent, but the war with Bulgaria was one great blunder, stupid and pointless from the start. The empire was forced to pay Bulgaria tribute, and ceded some frontier regions. The trade node was also moved back to Constantinople. His humiliations at the hands of Simeon were embarrassing to be sure, but when his wife died in 897, he could turn to happier pursuits. The marriage of Leo and Theophano had never been a happy one. They had no sons, only one daughter, and towards the end she retreated into religious seclusion forsaking her husband's bed. For the emperor, still only 30 and in dire need of a son, such a state of affairs was insufferable. Now, however, with no wretched father to watch over him, he could marry who he wanted, and Leo wanted one woman in particular, Zoe Zatzina, the daughter of Stylian and Leo's longtime lover. They had been split up by Basil several years before, but now Leo aimed to make her his wife. Rather inconveniently, Zoe already had a husband, but conveniently, some would say too conveniently, he died in 898. Shortly after, the lovebirds were married. Alas, it was not to last. In 899, Stylian died, and later in the year, Zoe followed her father to the grave. Unlike with his last wife, 
The Emperor loved Zoe deeply, and he was struck with a profound grief. It wasn't just the loss that shook him though, for his second marriage, much like his first, had only produced daughters. Leo, now twice a widower, still didn't have an heir. Although he was still only in his thirties, he had always been of frail disposition, and he couldn't be sure of how long he would live. His younger brother, Patriarch Stephen, had died after only six years on the job, and his youngest, Alexander, was a useless fop who spent more time drunk than sober. If the Empire was to remain stable, Leo needed a son. He needed to marry again. Here he began to run into a roadblock, the Orthodox policy on marriages. In the West, multiple marriages were normal, but in Orthodoxy they were frowned upon, with them becoming more and more sinful with each remarriage. The first time was fine, the second time was also fine, so long as a bit of penance was done. The third time, however, was regarded as little better than moderated fornication, and was punishable with four years of excommunication. And fourth times, dare they be considered, were considered polygamy, and were punishable with eight years of excommunication. Leo was now angling for a third, but the emperor hoped to secure a dispensation from the church. Being emperor, Leo wasn't necessarily bound by the same laws, especially when the stability of the state hung in the balance. Fortunately, Patriarch Antony Caulaeus saw the wisdom in his request, and let the emperor have his way. Thus Leo married once more in 900, this time to Eudokia Bayana. Third time's the charm, as they say, and finally in 901, a son was born. Tragically, Eudokia died during the birth, and the boy outlived her by only a few days. Leo, only 35, was single once more. The bad news continued into 902, when word reached the capital that the final imperial stronghold in Sicily had fallen to the Muslims. Byzantine power had been on the decline there for nearly a century. Now it was extinguished. The emperor, however, could spare little thought for Sicily. The issue of the succession still dominated the workings of his mind. Yet if he were to have an heir, then he would need to marry again. A plain impossibility in the view of the church. Yet it was an impossibility that Leo somehow would have to make possible. So he began laying the groundwork for another marriage. Firstly, he selected the strikingly beautiful Zoe Carbonopsina, the Colide, as his mistress. Then he moved her into the palace. The emperor made no secret of his union, while the church could only watch in uncomfortable silence. Even this was preferable to a fourth marriage. The couple first had a daughter in 904, and then, finally, a son in late 905. For the church, this uncomfortable situation could not continue forever. There was no question of the emperor marrying again, but neither could he continue to live with his mistress openly. Eventually, Patriarch Nicholas agreed to baptise the baby, and in return, Leo would remove Zoe the Colide from the palace, and set her aside. It was done, and on the 6th of January, 906, the prince was baptised under the name Constantine. The little prince had now been accepted into the church, but he was technically a bastard. Leo still needed to marry if he was to secure the succession, but he knew just as well as anyone else that he would never get permission for a fourth marriage. So, in his infinite wisdom, he simply didn't ask for permission. Secretly, without the patriarch's knowledge or consent, Leo VI married Zoe, and then all hell broke loose. The church had tolerated Leo thus far, but this was beyond the pale. Eminent clerics fired magazine after magazine of orthodox teachings at Leo, who had little choice but to grimace and suck it up. Patriarch Nicholas sternly reminded Leo of his promise not to see Zoe anymore. Yet the patriarch, a pragmatist at heart, was inclined to let Leo have his way. However, certain elements in the church were so opposed that Nicholas's hands were tied. The emperor, meanwhile, grew impatient. Nicholas was proving to be less than helpful, and Leo began casting around for a replacement. The man he settled on was Euthemios, an eminent ascetic who commanded much respect among those who were more opposed to the marriage. Euthemios was held in high regard by those who most firmly opposed the marriage, but he was also on good terms with Leo, making him a well-placed replacement. If Leo could get him on side, then he would be able to quell most of the die-hard opponents, and calm the troubled waters in which he found himself. He then turned to the Pope, Sergius III, for help. He had several good reasons to believe that the Pope would help him out. Firstly, the issue of fourth marriages was never really a problem in the Catholic Church. Secondly, this gave the Pope the perfect opportunity to stamp his will over the Eastern Church, so there was no way he would miss this opportunity. 
Thirdly, the authority of the Pope was still widely upheld in Constantinople, so this would greatly help Leo's cause. It was simply an opportunity too good to miss. Meanwhile, Leo prepared the ground for Nicholas's removal as Patriarch. By now, Nicholas's opinions had hardened, and Leo was barred from entering the Hagia Sophia. So Leo spuriously claimed that Nicholas was involved in a military revolt that was currently ongoing. Leo played his cards well. All at once, his preparations slotted into place. Nicholas was dubiously deposed and replaced with Euthemios, and Pope Sergius granted the fourth marriage his approval. The new patriarch, now armed with the papal judgment, was able to grant Leo a dispensation. This did not mean that Euthemios approved of the marriage, merely that he sanctioned it. There were a few catches. Zoe would never be an Augusta, while Leo could only attend church as a penitent, but these were humiliations that they could live with. At long last, he had an heir. Prince Constantine was crowned as co-emperor in 908, and through him the Macedonian dynasty would survive for another century and a half. Leo could pride himself on a job well done. With Leo's marriages done and dusted, we can take a look at the situation abroad during the last years of his reign. Once again, it was the Muslims who were causing the most trouble. Sicily had finally fallen to them in 902, while the key port of Demetrias in the Aegean was destroyed by Muslim pirates. Yet the worst of the seaborne attacks was still to come. In 904, a fleet led by the Greek renegade Leo of Tripoli sailed into the Sea of Marmara, before being forced back. Instead of retreating home, however, Leo of Tripoli made a beeline for Thessalonica, the second city of the empire. Caught with their pants down, the Thessalonicans held out for a few days before the walls crumbled. The pirates poured in, and this bustling centre of commerce was reduced to a smoking pile of rubble. Apparently, when the pirates finally left, they did so with 30,000 prisoners in tow. Whether that last fact is true or not, it highlights the humiliation this was for Leo, and he resolved not to take it lying down. Immediately, preparations were made for a revenge attack on the port of Tarsus. A fleet under Himerios and an army under Andronicus Ducas would meet at the port of Ateleia, and from there they would assault Tarsus. Yet when the time came to embark, Andronicus rose in revolt. Nothing really came of this, but it deprived Himerius of the army, so the admiral took the foolhardy decision of undertaking the attack by himself. Surprisingly, this went perfectly. Himerius destroyed a Muslim fleet before raising Tarsus to the ground, restoring Byzantine honour in the process. Meanwhile, Leo kept up the pressure on the Eastern Front, and the military theme of Mesopotamia was created during the final years of his reign. During these last years, Himerius would continue to serve with distinction, ravaging the coasts of Syria and fighting Cretan pirates. Riding high off this wave of success, in 911 the Emperor made plans for the last great escapade of his reign, the reconquest of Crete. The island served as a base for Muslim pirates ever since its capture in the 820s, and its recovery would be vital for the security of the Aegean. For his own sake, he should have just left it alone. The siege dragged on for half a year, with the Byzantines failing to make any impression, until word reached Himerios that the Emperor was ailing. Himerios ordered the abandonment of the siege and reluctantly retreated, but as the fleet was rounding Chios, it was attacked by Leo of Tripoli and annihilated. Leo lived just long enough to get news of the catastrophe, but the Emperor's life was fading fast. On the 11th of May 912, he died. He was 45. Does Leo deserve his title? Was he really the wise? Certainly, as far as scholars go, he was unmatched, but as an emperor. He was conscientious and diligent, even if not all of his plans worked out. He was popular and died well loved by the people, respected for his charm and generosity. As undignified as his search for a son may have been, it's only thanks to his dogged determination that Byzantium enjoyed such a long era of continuity under the Macedonian dynasty. Militarily, Leo was a mixed bag, although, with the sole exception of his war with Bulgaria, these weren't always due to his own failings. When the Byzantines mourned his loss, they did so with good reason. Many thanks to my generous consul tier YouTube member, Chris Manger, for supporting the channel. Being a YouTube member really is the best way to help the channel out, so if you want to see more, then consider doing that.